Hello there, ladies and gentlemen. You already know that in modern games, level development of opponents with number over their heads are increasingly common. Even in the latest games, where RPG elements are completely out of place, there is still level gradation of enemies. And in this video, we will figure out how and why developers implement the level progression of hostile mobs in games. So guys, don't forget to subscribe to this channel to stay in touch. And in our community, on Reddit and Discord, there is a lot of interesting content about games. So come visit there and stay if you are interested. One of the most common enemy level system is auto-leveling, of course, or automatically changing the enemy's strength depending on the player's leveling. In theory, the main advantage of such a system is the constant challenge. It does not allow you to pump hard enough to defeat any mob with a single shot or hit. In addition, automatic leveling does not let the battles get boring. But in practice, if a player needs three strikes to kill a single rat in both the first and hundredth power of the game, such a progression is only annoying. Auto-leveling can kill the feeling of character development, because during these 100 hours the player has learned dozens of skills and found the best equipment. It will be strange if all these become worthless and does not increase the chances of winning at all. To solve this problem, the developers do not apply auto-leveling to all enemies. For example, you can set a ceiling for some opponents and not strengthen bosses at all. In a game with an open world and large number of quests, auto-leveling helps to maintain the quality of the content. In Witcher 3, the player can pick up various quests and orders back in Velen and remember them only after end credits. By default, of opponents does not change depending on the player's leveling, so it becomes boring to engage in these quests. After all, if at the start of the game a 5th level ghost steals some kind of threat, then by the end of the campaign a super strong witcher will deal with it with one hit. Just imagine what happens when you face the opponents you suffer it from recently. Now you're pulverizing them as if they don't exist at all. Yeah, it's all nice, it's very simple, no one can harm you, there is just nothing to fight anymore and you get bored. Auto-leveling allows you to correct players' differences and challenges. In addition, it motivates the player to rely not only on equipment, because in equal conditions the outcome of the battle depends more on how well the player has mastered the combat system and not on the damage of his weapon. And for example, in Witcher 3 it can be turned on manually. This feature was added after the release. Unsuccessfully auto-leveling is used in Mass Effect Andromeda. All opponents in the game are pumped together with the main character, but his upgrades reaches a maximum at the 80th level, and the upgrades of some companions stop at the 53rd. The enemies continue to be pumped even after the player has reached the maximum characteristics. Another common grading system for opponents is constant level. They allow the game designer to adjust the pace of the game and slow down the player. Mob levels are often static in MMORPGs and open-world games. For example, such system was used in the Assassin's Creed, where some areas are inaccessible for exploration until the player gains enough strength. Permanent levels appeared in the purebred shooter Wolfenstein Youngblood, which neither critics nor player like it. The level design of the game encourages research, because the developers from Arcane Studio help it with it. But there is interesting thing, both low-level enemies and almost invincible ones in the same location. So a curious player, while exploring the territory, may run into a bunch of enemies several levels above his own. In addition, the opponents were constantly reborn, and this brought the situation to point of absurdity. If the player still made his way through the crowd of high-level Nazis to the next location, on the way back, the defeated were waiting for him there again. Players often criticize this approach also because it artificially stretches the passage and forces to grind. 
These problems are especially noticeable in Assassin's Creed Odyssey. The game forces you to complete many side quests in order to level up for passage of the main plot. Moreover, an opponent who is too strong cannot be killed with a single hit with a hiding blade. Players were given to disable such a feature only the latest part of series, Valhalla. And in Cyberpunk 2077, you can't eliminate an enemy from behind if a school is painted over his head. This is how the game shows that the main character is too weak for this opponent. Static levels can generate really stupid situations, like gangs of street hooligans, which are more difficult to deal with than the corporate mercenaries. There is a similar problem in Witcher 3. The Witcher may be weaker than a pair of forest robbers. On the other hand, static level gives the player a sense of the development. When returning to old location, he will deal with once formidable opponents much faster. For example, in Dark Souls 3, the first hours of the game is easier to avoid the Knights of Lothric than to engage them in open combat. It may even seem easier to defeat the first couple of bosses, but when the player has returned to the Wall of Lothric, to the Dancer of the Cold Valley, it will not be difficult to defeat the Knights. If earlier it took 5-6 hit and careful dodges to kill them, now the player can defeat the enemies with a couple of swing of the sword. Independent levels can also influence the narrative, because sometimes you need to show the invincibility of certain opponent at the stage of the game. In The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild, Ganon can be defeated at any stage of the game, and Alduin from Skyrim does not receive damage at all until the player reach the battle of him in the story, until he gains strength. The sensation of auto-leveling and static level vary from player to player, so it's impossible to say for sure which, which opinion is ideal for leveling opponents. Therefore, some games give you the opportunity to choose a convenient type of it, the same third Witcher or Assassin's Creed Odyssey. Creating a good level progression of opponents consists of two components, qualitative and quantitative. Qualitative progression is expressed in new spells, skills and equipment, which not only make the player stronger, but also give other ways for expressing strength. The quantitative consists mathematical changes, such as increase health by 10 points or damage by 5%. Such a progression is easier, because it does not require the creation of new assets and helps to dilute qualitative development. The character becomes stronger by himself, regardless of the equipment found. And of course, one of the keys to good game design is to achieve a balance between quantitative and qualitative. Without a doubt, this is one of the most difficult dilemmas faced by developers. The most successful design is allow the player to be slightly stronger than the opponents at the expense of a quantitative advantage. Then you present the player with a qualitative advantage, like a new spell that changes the gameplay, and opponents can be made a little stronger to create a new challenge for the player. The developers Breath of the Wild combined two approaches to pumping opponents. Although they hit the result from the eyes of the player, data miners found out that under the hood of the Breath of the Wild there is a hybrid system of level progression. The first 10 kills of most mobs, except the most basic ones like Choo Choo and Bacoblins, give experience points. In the case of bosses, points are given once when winning. The quality of loot can be found in Hyrule is tied to this experience, and due to the fact that weak creatures do not give points, it will not change until the player passes the starting location, because there is no one else there. Not only the player is pumped, but also the opponents. The more Bokoblings Link defeats, the stronger they become. Each enemy class has a scaling parameter, which is 0 is false or 1 is true. If the scaling of particular mob is 0, then it can change its appearance and strength. For example, a red goblin will turn green and become stronger. If the scaling is equal to 1, then the red mob will always be red, even after resurrection on a blood moon. And you can see on the fan interface 
directive map, you can find out the scaling of particular mob is and not only. And pumping drop-down weapons work in the same way. Over time, higher quality equipment with a special modifiers appears in the game. In whatever sequence the player passes for the game zones, loot improves equally within the types of characteristic of each biome. So, the result will be this. Auto-leveling has the right to exist, because creating a large amount of content is a time-consuming process, but the technology itself needs to be competently balanced within a separate project, and it's maybe best to do the balance manually, thinking over the ideal gaming experience for everyone. And guys, tell us in the comments how you like the video and if such a topic is interesting to you. How do you think? How to do auto-level correctly? Or it's better to think over the entire player's leveling manually? It will be interesting to read and speculate with you. And I remind you to subscribe to this channel so as not to miss the new one videos, news and it's just to really helps me to expand the channel. And you can find other interesting topics about games on this channel. And I'm not saying goodbye to you all and I see you at the next checkpoints and thank you for watching.